Hello YouTube, welcome back to Nutkin Farm. Feels like an age since we've spoken. Um, it's been a few weeks since I've been here and during those few weeks it's been raining cats and dogs. So there hasn't really been a point in coming up here and uh, taming the rest of the grass at, uh, or retaming some of the grass that's been mowed. Um, I've had a look around quickly and there's plenty to do. But as you can possibly see amongst these tree rows here, you can see the beneficial effect of the herbicide keeping grass away from the harvest row. And you can just see a few early signs of some early nut dropping from these three, four, four trees. So hopefully there's a lot more to come, uh, but uh, and hopefully it'll hold off a little bit because we still need to get this place mulched and groomed for that um, for those harvest runs. But anyway, um, what I thought I'd talk to you today about actually was inspired by a comment uh, in res uh, comment on uh, an earlier interview done by a guest of mine on the macadamia show bruce chester he got interviewed uh, about his organic macadamia farming by someone else a few years ago and some angry poster commented that macadamia farming was the scourge of the northern rivers and that these farmers come along and spray bulldog everywhere and pollute the whole place now, um, I had a bit of a giggle at the comment because, you know, bulldog is such a harmless pesticide. It's, it's, you know, it's less harmful than what you'd find in a can of Mortine for household use. In fact, you could almost drink the stuff, although it would taste terrible. Anyway, Bruce put in a spirit of defence and said, well, no, you're growing a native rainforest tree in its own climate. It's, you know, what, what else would you want to plant, you know, in, in this particular part of the world it's not a scourge at all it's a um, it's a beautiful thing and um, good on you Bruce I know you're watching um, good on you for for coming to everyone's defense even those who who don't farm organically like you do but it sort of brought to mind you know the question that we all have to think about when we're farming and that is what is our social license to farm what is what is the good what is the social good that we do in farming? And with macadamias, you could say, oh, well, that's easy. You know, everyone loves macadamias. You go up to someone in the street and say, I'm a macadamia farmer. They'll pat you on the back and good on you, mate. I love macadamias. You go for it. It's not quite that simple. Um, anything you do as a farmer, or in fact, anything you do with land anyway, has a, has a cost and it can have benefits and they have to be sort of weighed up against each other. And the social license, I guess, is the social acceptability of doing what you do in the climate. And climate meaning, um, you know, geographic, political, um, whatever that is. So how do macadamia, how does macadamia farming rack up against those sorts of measures? And, well, I mean, you've had plenty of videos from me and you can see them on the Australian Macadamia channel about macadamias being resource hungry. That is, they require fairly heavy feeding to produce a crop. Although you can keep that largely organic and you can use fertilisers that don't leach and pollute waterways and that sort of thing. So it's not the kind of activity that would be bad from a resource point of view. And you do get, you know, reasonably heavy crops per tree when you do that. But what about the big kahuna? What about water? And um, there's been some research into how much water an adult macadamia tree like this uses. And the stats would um, initially boggled my mind. In the warmer months, an adult macadamia tree will use around 60 litres of water per day, per tree. And in winter, it doesn't go down too much more. It goes down to about 30 litres per tree. So when you multiply it out and you average it at, say, 45 litres, the midpoint, a macadamia tree will use 315 litres of water a week. And that calculates out to 16,380 litres of water a year. Now, if you assume sort of a midpoint and say that an adult macadamia tree like this might have 12 kilos of nuts for me I hope it does um, 
you can start doing your long divisions and here you go at 12 kilos of nuts per tree it takes 1,365 litres of water to produce a kilo of nut in shell. But unless you're a very strange person, you don't eat nut in shell, you eat kernel. So when you multiply that out to kernel, because the kernel's only a third of each nut, it actually works out 4,095 litres for a kilo of macadamia kernels. That's a lot of water. And if you want to really do the maths and go down to the fact that you know, the average macadamia kernel is about 2.5 grams. Each macadamia kernel you put in your mouth cost 10.25 litres of water to make. That's for a single kernel. So when you're having a handful of kernels, um, you know, eight, eight or so kernels, that was 100 litres of water that went into that. That's, that's doing that particular math. Now, of course, rain does other things too. It sustains the tree and, and that sort of thing. It doesn't all go into the nut. But if you assume that you're only growing nut trees for the purpose of making nuts, and that's, I guess, a fair assumption, that's the kind of water that it uses. And you would think, that's such a water-hungry crop. Um, you know, surely there are other things you can grow that use less water. And you'd be right, because uh, citrus, for example, apparently uses about one-sixth or one-seventh of macadamias in terms of producing their crop. Now, there's no accurate maths there in terms of kilo for kilo. Um, all, all it's really saying is that citrus is a less thirsty crop than macadamias. And um, how does that affect social licence? Well, you know, you wonder you know when the time comes and people start looking at land use if climate change really gets as bad as people says it will you know will macadamia farmers in places be tapped on the shoulder and say look you know love your nuts but we're going to have to grow something to feed the world here um, rather than something that takes up a lot of water per kilo of food product and um I see that as most likely happening. If it happens at all, it'll happen in areas that are irrigated because when you're irrigating with water that could be used for other crops, water that doesn't naturally fall from the sky, well, then you start getting into these value judgments about which is better than, than which. Um, here in the Northern Rivers, you really need to look at the kind of water that falls here. We've just had 365 millimetres in January, which is above the 230 odd millimetres that's um, average for Rosebank. The, uh, the Alstonville platter got about 230 millimetres, but Rosebank really, really went over the top. So if you've ever wondered, when they say there's a millimetre of rain, how much is that over a hectare? And this is the wonderful thing about the metric system. A millimetre of rain in a square metre is a litre of water. So a hectare is 10,000 square metres. So a millimetre of rain over a hectare is 10,000 litres. I grow 13 planted hectares here, so when there's a millimetre of rain, I've got um, 130,000 litres of water having fallen on my trees. So um, in January, when we got 365 millimetres of rain, I had a grand total in my calculation of 47,450,600 litres fall on my 13 planted hectares over January. That's a hell of a lot of water. Now, you can't go too far into the voodoo maths here because of course, you know, you can say it's falling on your planted hectares, but you know, it waters the grass, some of it goes in runoff, um, some of it goes into the water table, not all of it goes into the trees. But if you go back to those, you know, numbers of litres per kernel, um, you know, if you, if you assume all the water went to the trees, well, January's rain would be enough for 11 and a half tonnes of macadamia kernel just out of January's rainfall. And this repeats right down, right through to May, May, sometimes June. Um, so you could say certainly for the area, and it is the native area for macadamias, there is plenty of water to produce this crop. And so you could argue on that basis that the fact macadamias are a water-hungry crop doesn't matter. You're not taking water away from some other activity. And, um, and you could sort of deal with it 
deal with it that way. Like I said, it's, it's when it comes to irrigation and you're choosing what to irrigate for. We've seen some aggro at the cotton industry because cotton's a very water thirsty crop and the cotton farmers taking water out of the Murray catchment is very controversial. Um, up in Bundaberg, the macadamias take water out of the Paradise Dam and while the Paradise Dam's in a bit of trouble still, um, you know, it's being paid for, people can make a profit irrigating there. Um, but, you know, 20, 30 years down the track, if Australia becomes a very different place, um, you'd have to wonder whether that's a long-term plan. One of the other arguments we can come up with for why growing macadamias is, is a good thing. I mean, I'm looking around me now and all I'm seeing is good, but I'm biased. What about carbon? We know that macadamias are about 70% oil um, and that's great. It's a hydrocarbon. It takes a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere, um, making the nut. Um, but how good are macadamia trees as a carbon sink? Well, that was measured um, by a, a number of people, including Southern Cross um, University academics. And they looked at the carbon sequestration of macadamias, that is how much carbon it took out of the atmosphere um, per macadamia tree. And they measured three things. They measured the carbon in the tree itself, generally, how much it, the, the tree used, um, how much the macadamia kernel used, which is the concentrated macadamia oil, and thirdly, the shell and the husk, and they measured the amount of carbon in the shell and the husk to sort of work out how much, uh, how much carbon they took out of the system. Guess which was the biggest? It wasn't the kernel. My guess would have been the kernel because that oil is so concentrated and has such a lot of hydrocarbon in it, I would have thought it would be the biggest contributor. But no, in terms of tonnes per hectare, uh, the dry weight of kernel um, really ended up taking out 2.7 tonnes of carbon um, a year. That's um, per hectare. The tree itself took out four tonnes of carbon per year, per hectare. But the big one was the carbon in the shell and the husk. The shell has such a hard texture. In fact, it's the hardness of aluminium. But the shell was so hard that it actually took out 8.7 tonnes um, of carbon dioxide, basically, per year um, for a grand total of 15.4 tonnes um, per year, per hectare. So over large macadamia farms, you're going to get quite a substantial carbon sink um, out of a cropping macadamia tree. And that's a reasonable argument for why you might grow macadamias. As to being the scourge of the northern rivers, well, you know, my own views on that are very similar to Bruce's. It's not really a scourge. This place, most of the northern rivers up to about the Channon, was logged for its cedar and um, you know, it's timber built half of Sydney back in the day, back in the late 1800s. And a lot of these places were cattle farms. They were just pasture. It was, it was probably the furthest thing from the natural environment. At least when you're planting trees like this, you've got um, you know, a rainforest tree being planted in a rainforest area. It's not gonna make a whole ecosystem. Sure, we plant them in rows. It's a little bit artificial, but Having trees help keep the soil in place uh, and, you know, shading the ground and providing a bit of habitat for birds and other creatures seems to me a lot more natural and beneficial than um, a lot of other activities you could do on the same land. And uh, particularly given that rainfall and other patterns tend to match what the macadamia tree needs, you can do it here without making a huge impact on um, on the surrounds and plus it's pretty and very peaceful there's nothing like walking down a row of macadamia trees for me it's the it's the combination of serenity and order that somehow somehow get me every time anyway think about that and by all means offer a comment in the section below you know what do you think about the social license to produce macadamias is macadamia farming 
a good thing? Not just a feel good thing, but is macadamia farming a good thing in our area? Love to hear from you. Anyway, I'll be back in touch soon. Hopefully got some more exciting things coming for you, but I've got some mowing to do before the next lot of rain comes. So see you later.